not have to be worried about being influenced by the people around us at church as we worship this morning. And so I want you to just feel free to be who you need to be in front of the Lord this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's worship the Lord together. My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. Oh my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength. surrounds me, chaos abounding, my soul will rest in you. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. Oh my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength away. is true my God will come through always always I lift my eyes up my help comes from the
We'll be in uh, John chapter 6 this morning, and we'll, be pick, uh, we'll pick up reading in verse uh, 22. John chapter 6, verse 22. Um, a couple of announcements. We'll have this service uh, uploaded to YouTube after the service, and uh, Lord willing... Uh, in the future, we'll be able to live stream straight from YouTube. So uh, I'm thankful for Zoom and uh, its ability to be able to allow people to communicate. But the, uh, the quality of the video, the sound quality is much better um, with what we can do on YouTube. So we're going we're gonna to try that. Uh, you can also obviously catch... Um, the services on our radio station, and uh, you can stream them through uh, our website if you cannot pick up the radio station uh, frequency. So, well, let's pray and let's uh, get into John chapter 6. Lord, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for how you provide for us. Lord, even these, <laughs> this technology that we're working through and trying to figure out, Lord, thanks for what you have done, how you've helped us, and uh, Lord, we pray that as we look to your word now that you, by your spirit, would minister to your people, that you'd bless them, that you'd strengthen them that you would remind them that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. Our situation may change. Our <laughs> The weird uh, place we find ourselves in might change. But Lord, you never change. And so, Lord, we ask as we look to your word that you would Speak to our hearts, that you would give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. John chapter 6, verse 22. If you'll remember, last week we covered the section of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the sea. So previously, that's what the people had seen and been a part of, what the disciples had been a part of. And then we enter into this section, verse 22, where he starts talking about the difference between physical sustenance and being sustained spiritually. It says, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except that one which, were, which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, however... Other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread, after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum. They were seeking Jesus, it says, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you come here? Or when did you come here? So this is interesting. The, the people ch are chasing after him. And there's almost in the question here, almost a, not just a question, but almost a challenge. Like, what? Why did you leave us? Where are you going? You see, the people 
they're in this place where they remember Moses. They remember what Moses did, and Moses for them is a champion. He is, he's the one that provided bread for the people in the wilderness. And so they're looking for a sequel. <laughs> they're looking for Moses too to come along and to give them bread. So their thought, their understanding is all on the physical level. Verse 26 says, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And then Jesus, <laughs> here he cuts to the chase. He gives them wisdom. He speaks to them and says, here's why you're really here. And this is something you got to understand about God, is that he sees our heart. He knows exactly what our motives are, what our desires are. And a lot of times we like to well, we even lie to ourselves. We, we, we like to think we always have the best intentions. Well, Jesus here has the ability to cut through all of that and speak right to the heart of the people, speak right to their situation and say, look, guys, you're only here because you're hungry. It's breakfast. Uh, there was no bacon and eggs for the people. Well, no bacon for them, right? There was, there was no breakfast for the people. And they're just looking for food. They want all of their needs taken care of. And Jesus seems to be doing that. He seems to be taking care of that. He seems to be like a Moses. Jesus says to them in verse 27, he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus here gives us instruction about life, life in general, how we're supposed to live and what we're supposed to be focused on. He says these words, and I'll read it again. Do not labor. For the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So a couple of things he says here is that the Son of Man, the one sent by God, is anointed to give you food, and food that's not just uh, food you labor for and that it perishes, meaning you consume it and it's gone. But this is food that will sustain you day in and day out. It will sustain your soul. Notice in verse 28, then they said to him, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. So again, <laughs> these guys come and first they want food. They're, they're asking why he left them. And then he says, well, we want to do the works of God. And these people are like, hey, we want to work like you're working. We want to well, we wanna do the works of God. What shall we do? 
that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So how is it that I work for God? How is it that I do work like Jesus is working? Well, it comes one way. It comes by one truth. And there's only life in him. You see, to do the work of God, to have God's works flow in and through my life, it comes down to one thing, belief. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. From beginning to end, this is the message of the scriptures, that the just shall live by faith. That here, if I am to do the work of God, then it simply starts and continues as I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. This brings up, you know, a lot of questions because a lot of times we want to work for God. We want to we do God's work in this world. Well, for us, doing the work of God in this world starts with my f- putting my faith and trust in the one whom he sent. And it continues, it's sustained as I continue to put my faith and trust in the one whom he sent. As I have received Christ Jesus, so I am to walk in Christ Jesus. But see, these people standing on the shore, listening to him, they're hungry. All they can think about is their physical need. And this is something that we all struggle with. We all battle with. We struggle with the desire to just fulfill our flesh. Because our flesh is loud, and it speaks loudly, and it, and it calls out to us, and it says, we need this, or we have to have that. Think about when you're, you're really hungry, or you're really thirsty. Those desires move you to do things to try and fulfill those needs. And they're like, hey, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answers and said, says to them, this, <coughs> excuse me, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So with this, Here these people are, and they are challenging him. They're saying, we need a sign. We need a sign like Moses. If you're going to be Moses, if you're going to be like Moses, if you're going to be the prophet that Moses talked about that was going to be sent by God, then we need a sign. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't you just get a sign? Did he not just feed 
5,000 people. You notice the disciples don't speak up here. They're, they're not offering a defense for Jesus. They're quiet. They're allowing Jesus to defend himself. They said, look, we want a sign. Look, we're, we're happy with the food you're providing. We're happy with the miracles you're, you're, you're doing. We're happy with how people are being healed. And, and those are great things. But for us to really believe you, for us to put our faith and trust in you, show me a sign. Notice what Jesus says. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus answering their call to give them a sign. He speaks to them and says, you know what, guys? Moses, he didn't give you this bread. Moses did not provide manna in the desert for the people. It was the Father who is in heaven who gave this bread. But the Father who is in, in heaven, he sent the true bread, Jesus says here. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So a couple of things to point out is where we look at what Jesus says here. Number one, Jesus speaks of heaven as it is a real, literal place. It is not some place where we all just uh, get assumed into all our soul, you know, all our souls come together and we we become part of this ethereal understanding of God. He talks about it as a real place. He talks about it as a real place that he came down from. So it's up above. It's heaven. The apostle Paul speaks of heaven, and he says he, after <laughs> being stoned, rocks thrown at his head, and he was left for dead. He says, he saw a place. He was taken into the third heaven. And he said he wasn't able. It wouldn't be right for him to describe what he saw. See, so here Jesus is establishing for us that heaven is not just a figment of our imagination, but it's a real, actual place that he came down from. And it's a real, actual place where God dwells. And it's a real, actual place where those who are, those who are receiving of this true bread from heaven will be with the Lord. He says, he says, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my, <coughs> excuse me, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So this bread that comes down from heaven is bread that doesn't just give you sustenance so that you can eat and then eat again the next day. 
This bread is life-giving. Okay, it's, it's not just nourishing like food. It's life-giving. And that life, he's going to go on to say, is life that never ends. Forever. Notice it says, Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. <clears throat> this, the, the, the statement they make here should sound familiar, right? It, it sounds like the woman at the well. Remember, Jesus was talking to her about living water. And he said, the water that I can give you, you'll never thirst again. <laughs> and all she could think was, I don't have to come back to this well. There is a vast difference and distance between what Jesus is speaking about and what they're understanding. And why is that? What separates us from truly understanding what God has for us. Well, let's go on. Let's keep reading. He says, or they said, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. So Jesus goes from the, <laughs> these people sitting, if you will, you could picture them in a dark room. Whereas he makes this statement and it's as if he opens the shutters and allows the sunlight to come in. He allows the light to shine here in this moment, in these next few verses. He reveals to them his true self. He doesn't say he who comes down from heaven. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, he who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. So there's a coming and there's a believing. And where are we coming to and where, what are we believing in? Him that he alone is the bread of life, that he alone is what sustains us for every single day that you and I go through. Because you and I can lean on a lot of different things. Oh, if I could just have my little quiet time. Oh, if I could just have my little me time over here. If, as long as I get coffee in the morning, <laughs> I'm good, man. We lean upon a, a, a lot of things, and in and of themselves, those things are not bad. Coffee's good. <laughs> They're not bad things. But when that is my life, you see, we are not to be given to anything. as a life-sustaining thing other than Jesus Christ. And see, here, he says to them, he, he opens the shutters, the light comes in. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me. And this statement he's making here is not just simply a statement about him being bread. <laughs> he's making a statement that he is, as God the Father is, the I am, the becoming one. He is what you need when you need it. 
He says, I am the bread of life. And then he makes an emphatic statement. It's emphatic in the original language. He says, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who, he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, again, remember, Jesus is not here speaking physically. He's not saying if you, if you become a Christian, you never have to eat food again and you never have to drink water again. So <laughs> if you hear that, then you're in the same position as these Jews that are just looking for food. What he's saying here is that your soul, your spirit has spiritual hunger, has spiritual thirst, has desires and needs that can only be met by the bread that came down from heaven, who is Jesus Christ. Never hunger. Never thirst. He says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So one of the things we, we see that Jesus reveals to us <coughs> is that seeing is not always believing. Sometimes we think, oh man, if, if this person could just see a sign, if God could just show him something, if God could just do something, then, then they would see it and they would believe. But Jesus shows us here that seeing is not always believing. It, it doesn't equate to believing. A sign, <laughs> 5,000 being fed, even the disciples seeing Jesus walk on the water. Seeing does not, not always bring us to a place of true belief. Jesus says, I'm right here in front of you. I'm telling you plainly that I am the bread of life. And you still don't believe. So Jesus here reveals that he knows their hearts. Verse 37 says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. A couple of things that the Lord reveals to us here. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So in the realm of salvation, one of the things that we see is that the Father is at work in the world drawing people to faith. The Holy Spirit is in the world drawing people to faith. To faith in what? In a religious system? No. In and <laughs> to an angel? No. To God manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And so here it says the Father is at work to draw men to come to Jesus Christ, to make a decision about Jesus Christ. And then it says this, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So a lot of people have understandings about salvation and they say, well, certain people are chosen for heaven and certain people are chosen for hell. But according to this, it says right here, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. You see, this gospel message, this good news, 
God, he decreed to show forth mercy to mankind and to allow the opportunity for all men everywhere, all women everywhere, all children everywhere to receive the good news of salvation. He made that offer to all. He says here that the Father's work is to draw people. As is going on with these Jews. They're being drawn to him. The works that Jesus is doing is drawing these people to consider him. But they have to make a decision. They either have to come to him, believe in him, or reject him. (laughs) The Apostle Paul, in the letter he wrote to the Ephesians, he says it like this. Speaking of salvation, speaking of these difficult things to understand sometimes. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory in him. You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So here Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me will by no means, well, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, think about this. (laughs) If someone was standing in front of you and they said, hey, I came down from heaven. Now, (laughs) that might be kind of hard to swallow. So I can understand these people in their position being like, wait a minute, what? You came down from heaven? You're the bread of life? I got to come to you, but you're just a man. 
But you have to remember that these people, the religious leaders, you remember that when Herod asked them, hey, where is this king going to be born? They knew. They knew. So they're not completely without understanding. There was an idea and a desire to see the Messiah come forward. He says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, I, I, I think as Jesus is saying this, and there's religious leaders around, that this is a, a finger in their chest. And he says, look, I'm not here to do my own will like you. I, I'm not here to just do what I want like you. I'm not here to set up this system that they had taken what God had made and perverted it for their own control of man. He said, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do my Father's will. The will of him who sent me. It says this, and this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing. So here Jesus ends this with some promises that we can take home. The idea of being eternally secure. The idea doesn't come from man, it comes from God. The idea here is that as I come to him, as I believe in him, as I abide in him, that I am secure. It says that all that he has given me, I should lose nothing. That means even if you're struggling, going through things where you're, you're, you're finding it difficult to believe. You're struggling in your flesh. There are times where the devil will come along where your own thoughts will hound you and say, you know, you're not really a Christian. But see, my being a Christian is not bound up in my do's and don'ts. It's bound up in Jesus Christ. Have I come to him? How do I believe in him? Is he the bread of life that I'm holding on to? Well, if, if he is, then he will not lose you. It says here, but should, be, uh, should raise it up at the last day. So not lost and raised up. Not lost, eternally secure in Jesus Christ and raised up. Meaning you and I who believe in Christ, who receive him as our Lord and Savior, will be raised up at the last day with the Lord. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And you say to yourself, I haven't seen him. Remember, We're talking about spiritual things. When it says seize him, it's talking about you 
coming to him and believing in him. See, that's seeing, right, spiritually. Your eyes have been opened. The Father has drawn you. Your eyes are open, and you recognize that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. Sees him. It says that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. So not just that your eyes are opened, but as your eyes are opened, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 